Welcome back, everyone, to our audience here and our audience online. I would now like to introduce our second session this afternoon, starting with our first speaker, Taylor Carr Howard, who will be introduced by Sarah Beckman, both of whom are joining us from the University of California, Los Angeles. Welcome, Sarah and Taylor. Thank you, Rebecca, for that introduction. Um, it gives me great pleasure today to introduce our next speaker, Taylor Carr Howard, a doctoral candidate in the Interdepartmental Program in Archaeology at UCLA. Taylor is the first student in archaeology to represent UCLA at this symposium. And I do want to thank my colleagues in art history in the selection committee, David Schneller, Tiffany Barber, and Bronwyn Wilson for supporting thought-provoking and interdisciplinary work in and beyond their departments. Taylor took her BA at Scripps College in Art History and an MA at Ar in Archaeology at Cornell. She joined the PhD program at UCLA to continue exploring her long-standing and wide-ranging interests in classical art, Roman provincial landscapes, and the art of photography. Her dissertation, a post-colonial study of 19th and early 20th century archaeological photographs of Roman-era monuments in North Africa, successfully combines these interests in truly novel and admirable ways a fact that is underscored by her recent receipt of the Archaeological Institute of America's John R. Coleman Traveling Fellowship in 2022 to 2023. Taylor's PhD project, a portion of which she will share with you today, brings attention to how 19th and 20th century colonial powers used so-called objective and scientific art forms, archaeology and photography, to construct national identities and to cement colonial authority in occupied territories. This work is as fascinating as it is necessary in this day and age, but let me also commend Taylor here and now for pushing the temporal and geographic boundaries of ancient in her work and for challenging the disciplinary boundaries that sometimes divide archaeology and art history. Her paper today is entitled Archaeological Photographs and the Creation of Roman North Africa. Please join me in welcoming Taylor. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you to the Getty for hosting us and all the organizers for putting this together today. Oops. Okay. In 1839, after an expedition to Algeria, Prince Ferdinand Philippe, the Duke of Orléans, made plans to move the third century Arch of Caracalla from Jamila to Paris. The arch marked the entrance to the Roman city Severan Forum and is decorated with Corinthian columns and an inscription informing its viewers that it was dedicated by local citizens to honor the Emperor Caracalla, his mother Julia Damna, and his deified father Septimius Severus. It was to be removed from this context and represented in Paris as, quote, a trophy of our conquest of Algeria alongside the inscription La Mai d'Afrique à la France, situating it instead within the context of French imperial ambition. This move was appealing precisely because the architectural form itself was familiar. Similar monuments were found in France, including Gallo-Roman commemorative arches like that in Orange, as well as the more modern monument of the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, which was dedicated in 1836. The Roman Arch Monument has a complicated reception history, and this example demonstrates a common misreading of this architectural form. Scholarship now tends to refer to these arches as commemorative, make, marking a shift from their 19th century association as triumphal. Because such monuments were a commonplace feature of the Roman Empire, with examples present in every region of the Mediterranean, they are seen as a mark of Romanization, or the idea that the Romans asserted domination over the peoples they colonized, bringing their culture to an otherwise blank or culturally lacking canvas, which can be seen represented architecturally through the presence of a recognizable set of urban monuments. However, in most cases, these urban forms like commemorative arches were not an extension of Roman military might over the provinces, as the Duke and his contemporaries saw it but rather a way for local elites and city councils to demonstrate their link to Rome and to the emperor and thus their own local power. Ferdinand Philippe's efforts ultimately failed due to expense as well as the obvious technical and practical challenges associated with moving monumental architecture such great distances. And the, um, and the project was ultimately abandoned after his death. 
However, this project remains an example of broader French efforts to construct a direct material link between Roman and French imperialism in North Africa through archaeology, restoration, and collecting efforts in the region. In what follows, I will consider these efforts focusing specifically on the way that photography and the building of massive, massive photographic archives allowed for an alternative means of collecting Roman monumental architecture. First, I will overview a history of archaeology in the region before turning to the representation of one monument in a single archive, examining how its representation constructs a particular relationship with the archaeological material itself. Archaeology in North Africa began almost immediately following French colonization. Between 1830 to 1870, French military officers began exploring Roman remains in Algeria. During this early period, there was particular interest in studying and taking lessons from Roman methods of colonial control. French officers drew from classical authors, including Strabo, Polybius, and Livy, for inspiration of how to handle the geography and local populations they encountered in North Africa. Such texts became an important means for connecting the French imperial project to Roman history. The physical connection to Roman colonial efforts through archaeological material was also of utmost importance in making this connection. French officers relied on Roman roads, aqueducts, and military fortifications for their own military efforts. By engaging directly with these material remains, French officers positioned themselves as part of this classical lineage. In some cases, this construction was quite literal. For example, one French military unit in Algeria reconstructed the tomb of a Roman soldier, reburying him with French military honors. Beginning with Napoleon's 1798 campaign in Egypt, documenting and collecting antiquities became an important component of European imperialism. Such practices expanded over the course of the 19th century in what Suzanne Marchand has termed the antiquities rush with archaeology becoming an important tool for justifying European colonialism and representing these territories to European publics. The late 19th and early 20th centuries were a sort of heyday for archaeology in North Africa, with major excavations done at many of the main urban sites in the Maghreb, including at Bula Regia, Carthage, Leptis Magna, and Volubilis. Excavations during this period focused in particular on Roman material culture at the expense of prehistoric, Punic, or Islamic material, which were often dug past and cleared away. Research focused especially on monumental urbanism. During this period too, particular attention was pa paid to clearing these sites and restoring major monuments for tourism, creating a set of picturesque examples of the Roman North African city. Because this work happened overseas, the results of such projects were communicated primarily through visual means. Images of archaeological sites were sent to funders and administrators back in France, published in archaeological journals and books, and used as teaching tools. For example, the image on the left, oh, sorry. For, the, for example, the image on the left is a lantern slide, a commercially manufactured glass plate image, which when viewed through the magic lantern, would project a large-scale version of the image similar to a slide projector. Such images were used frequently in public lectures and sold as pedagogical sets in the early decades of the 20th century. The, Im the image on the right is an illustration from an archaeological publication documenting major art and architecture of Algeria, both Roman and non-Roman sites alike. Photography, especially, proved to be an important tool for communicating about archaeological work. While images of archaeological sites were a popular subject for photographers almost immediately after its invention, the medium was much more slowly incorporated into, a field, into the field of archaeology, with the first few examples of photography during excavations in the 1860s, and widespread use of, the, of photography in the field not taking hold until the 1870s. Archaeological photographs represent the point at which professional interpretation and public perception of sites converge. While photographs are important tools for archaeologists, they are generally broadly legible to amateur audiences. These Im images fundamentally alter public perception of the sites, while also designating which sites are worthy of fo preserving photographically, archivally, and contributing to a canon responsible for constructing notions of Western civilization and heritage. 
This transformed not only public perception of classical sites, but notably influenced archaeological presentation and interpretation of these sites as well, in ways that continue to impact the discipline of classical archaeology today. In the case of Roman North Africa, this can be observed in the widespread photographic focus on monumental urbanism. Because these, monument, because these images remove monuments from their broader context, it's easy to draw comparison between a large number of sites, allowing for the creation of certain typologies and reinforcing the idea that these architectural forms were a physical manifestation of Roman imperial force that occurred the same way in different provincial cities. Archaeological photographs produce archaeological knowledge. However, I argue these images are also sites in which complex negotiation of meaning are played out, including but not limited to the assertion of aesthetic judgment and claims of ownership and heritage. These images are points of contact, sites in which meaning is negotiated, not simply in the act of taking the image, but each time it is engaged through the publication, viewing, and archival encounters. The meaning of the archaeological material is thus entangled with the possession, organization, and circulation of its image. To turn now to a specific example, I want to consider a couple of images from the Ponceau collection, housed at the Institut National de l'Histoire de l'Art at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. This collection contains the personal papers and professional archives of three generations of French archaeologists who worked in North Africa between the 1880s and 1960s, that of Julien, Louis, and Claude Ponceau. The collection also contains the archives of Bernard Roy, Alfred Merlin, and Paul Gockler, all of whom were French archaeologists working in Tunisia. Materials from all six overlap throughout the archive. The archive itself is organized thematically with folders on correspondence, publications, as well as various archaeological topics such as epigraphy and mosaics. Folders are further organized by site, all of which are from Tunisia. In this example, we will consider the way that one monument, the Capitolium at Duga, is represented within this archive. A Capitolium is a Roman temple dedicated to the triad of divinities, Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva, and is largely considered to be part of this standard set of Roman monuments that indicates Romanization of a provincial city. Capitoliums are especially popular in North Africa during the second and third centuries CE. Duga is located in Northwest Tunisia on top of a hill overlooking a fertile valley. The site has evidence of Numidian, Punic, Hellenistic, and Roman material. It has a group of public buildings, including the Capitolium, which largely date to the second and third centuries, giving it the reputation as one of the best preserved examples of Roman North African urbanism. The Capitolium Duga has a single cella and th with three niches and a dedication to the Capitoline Triad. It was built by provincial elites in the city on the site of the Roman Forum. The photographs from Duga include a wide range of material from 1880 to 1911, focusing in particular on restoration efforts in 1903 to 1904 and 1910 to 1911. Reproductions and illustrations are included alongside the photographs, as are souvenirs like, and more popular images like postcards. Also documentary material like archaeological journals. This collection is of interest because of the period that it covers, as well as the significant number of images it contains. The images are from this period in which photography is fully integrated into French archaeological excavation and projects, and the peak of colonial archaeology in North Africa. As we'll see in this example, the archive both records the archaeology done at this site over a period of time, but also a French relationship to the site itself. Now I'll show three representative examples of the types of images included in this archive. First, we have those images which are doc documentary in nature. These images document the excavation and restoration of the monument and serve as an important representation of archaeological labor in the archive. These are mostly action shots, such as, such as the image on the left, um, which depicts a man engaged in the restoration project at Duga. Framed from below, we see a worker standing on building supports and moving material using a pulley system. The sharp contrast between the supports and the sky create an overall graphic quality to the image and obscure the face and thus the identity of the figure in the center of the composition. In the middle image, a handwritten caption narrates what we are looking at, quote, work viewed from the west. 
Unlike many of the other images of the archive, this image does not show the Capitolian head on. Rather, only its columns are visible in the right of the image. Instead, the focus in this image are on two workers in the foreground and the rubble behind them. Finally, in a third image, we see a collective effort at clearing and restoring the site. Once again, the Capitolium itself is largely not visible to the viewer. The columns in the left third of the image mark the presence at a classical site, but the overall focus is on the work being done. Shot from above, the viewer's position looking down at the action. In the foreground, we see a man with a pickaxe. In the middle, there's a man crouching on top of archeological material and discussing it with two other men. Behind them, two more men fill a cart of rubble to carry off. And in the back, one man crouches near another in preparation to move heavy material. These images of archeological labor give us insight into who was performing the significant physical work associated with clearing this site and preparing it for excavation. These are a far cry from the cleaned up images we see in publication or in public facing images such as prints, advertisements, and postcards. As such, these images are also of notably lower quality. This print, for example, is a low quality print and there is an obstruction of our view in the foreground. However, they do give us a sense of the embodied nature of archeological work, as well as the interpersonal dynamics at play. For example, these images reveal that the labor performed on site, as was common, was performed by local laborers, whose work is otherwise obscured in the archive. Often, archaeological photographs depicting local laborers are posed images, using these figures to represent the scale of the monuments around them. These documentary images instead present them in action and as active participants in the production of archaeological knowledge. However, their identities are largely obscured, both due to the composition of the images, the low quality of the prints, an effect of which, which is ever more pronounced by their lack of inclusion in the written record in the archive. The presence of such images in this archive testify to a desire to document the process of excavation and interpretation. They stand in direct contrast to the more composed images that we see in archeological publications or public facing images of this period. That is, they stand in direct contrast to the images used in the interpretation of the site. Instead, testifying to a desire to document the process of excavation for the historical record. The second type of image that we see in this archive are those which are more artistic in nature, representing the types of prints that would have been more public facing or had a touristic function. In this image, we see the Capitolium from its interior, looking out over the portico with a pediment and columns framing the center of the composition. The left third of the composition shows the interior walls of the temple and a shadow bisects the composition diagonally, drawing our eye down through the composition. Here, the archeological form is used as a framing device for the figures sitting underneath the pediment. Three figures sit on a fallen architrave, one adult facing two children. To the left of these figures, another adult leans against one of the columns with three children surrounding him. Each of these figures is dressed in non-Western local clothing. This is a familiar trope, which we see in other images throughout the archive, as well as in drawings. In each of these images, the monument looms large, dominating the composition. The inclusion of local actors orientalizes these images, serving as a reminder that these familiar architectural forms are not in Europe, but in an unfamiliar location, playing into orientalist tropes and situating the locally, local population in a temporally distinct location from the viewer of the image. Such examples underline the broader visual culture of orientalism in which archeological photographs circulate. They thus serve as a reminder that photography contributed to the discursive context of Orientalism, serving as proof for earlier, earlier scenes represented in Orientalist painting. More importantly for the subject of the paper, however, they demonstrate the ways these images influence the interpretation of archeological material, how such images locate this interpretation within the context of Orientalist tropes, thus distancing local stakeholders from the formation of archeological knowledge and from the heritage sites of their own country. Like I've mentioned, postcards and other popular media appear throughout this archive. In some cases, these are blank postcards, but in others like this one, the postcard functions as a surface for a specific document. This postcard is addressed to Bernard Roy, an archeologist working in Tunisia, and discusses upcoming excavations at the site, specifically that of a theater and a house. 
The vertical orientation of this postcard allows the image to dominate the page with the caption Duga Roman Temple written below it. The image itself is secondary, functioning as a background against which to discuss archaeology. It thus functions to contextualize this conversation. The image is produced by a popular studio in Tunis, and postcards mass produce standardized images of the site and function as a site for both the author and receiver to articulate a particular relationship with the archaeological site itself, in particular by communicating firsthand experience with the site. In this case, this, po this postcard was sent within Tunis to archaeologists working in the region, speaking to the ubiquity of image production and circulation of archaeological sites in Tunisia. Within the archive, these images work together to articulate a particular relationship with the Roman material of North Africa. Although the content of this archive is archaeology and the collection was put together by archaeologists, the inclusion of popular media and especially the wide range of photographs of a, uh, offer us a much broader view into the reception history of Roman material in Tunisia. The images in this archive document a key point in time in the history of archaeological photography, when it was becoming ever more ubiquitous in archaeological knowledge formation. It also demonstrates the convergence of professional and popular conception of the site, and the ways in which broader visual culture in which such images circulate contributes to an interpretation of archaeological material. Archaeological photographs transform our relationship to the site. While such images purport to bring their referent closer for a more detailed view, they actually remove this material from necessary archaeological context. As such, these images tell us much more about the act of interpretation than they do about the archaeological material itself. In short, these images mark points in time when the meaning of the archaeological material is negotiated and demonstrates the plasticities and meaning available. Such monuments can be documented as a site of archaeological rescue, transformation into a tourist site, or the documentation of a familiar architectural form in an unfamiliar oriental setting. Like efforts to move the physical monumental remains, these images symbolically remove these remains, and while the monument itself remains in situ, its interpretation has been firmly placed within a French frame of reference. As such, when we look at the archaeological photograph, we are not just looking at a single monument. We are instead looking at its symbolic appropriation, particular interpretations, and the politics of representation. As archaeologists and art historians, we need to no longer look past these images for the archaeological material they represent, but instead use them to reconstruct a history of their reception. Doing so will help us disentangle ancient and modern colonialisms, thus leading to a clearer picture of the Roman material, its colonial appropriations, and perhaps provide a path forward towards a more decolonial way of approaching archaeology in North Africa. Thank you. So I'm Kate Flint from the University of Southern California, and it's my enormous pleasure to introduce Anna Flinchbauer, who's a third year student in our doctoral art history program. She's also a candidate for the Visual Studies Graduate Certificate. Anna works primarily on late 19th and early 20th century decorative arts and textiles in Britain, Ireland, and the United States. She has an emphasis on the intersections of gender, labor, and materiality. At the moment, she's pursuing the entanglement of these interests in turn of the century embroidery workshops. Her research has very appropriately been supported by the William Morris Society in the United States as Dunlap Memorial Fellowship. Anna came to us with a BA in Human Ecology from Middlebury College and a dual master's degree in Library Science and Art History from the Pratt Institute. She's an active member of the USC Environmental Humanities Working Group 
and also of the Society of Architectural Historians, Historic Interiors Group. And those two um, groups reflect very much the interests that are strongly present in the paper that you're about to hear, Fluvial Flux, Negotiating Time and Space in CFA Voices River Rug. Thank you so much for that introduction, Kate. Um, thank you to everyone at the Getty who has helped organize this event, especially Rebecca, Mary, and William. And thank you all for joining me here today. So what happens when a rug does not look like a rug? How should a critic respond? What should we see? These are the questions that confronted viewers of the river rug in 1903. CFA Voise's river rug alternately called The River Mat or The River of Life, stands as one of the most original works in his prolific and varied career as an architect and designer. It was also one of the most perplexing. The rug flagrantly defied period design conventions. In attempting to make sense of the rug's strangeness, critics compared it variously to a medieval tapestry, a Chinese landscape, and a touristic panorama. Analyzing those comparisons, I trace how viewers steeped in turn-of-the-century British visual cultures understood the river rug's unusual perspectival and representational strategies. I argue that the embodied relationship between viewer and object suggested by the river rug challenged the ability of those strategies to perform their work of managing modernity. The river rug is a hearth rug measuring approximately four feet by eight feet. Its pictorial design shows a landscape of fields and forests arranged around a gently meandering river running down its center. The design confounds both temporality and linear perspective. Voise's own home, completed in 1901, is shown alongside sailing ships emblazoned with heraldic crests. Leaping horses and stags, which appear to clear entire hills in a single bound, dwarf ships and house. At center left, a trio of rabbits seem to be approximately identical in size to the two deer that occupy the field to their right. The shifting scale and strange perspective destabilize the viewer's gaze. Elements that are perfectly mundane when considered individually become odd when considered relative to each other in this pictorial space. Like rabbits that equal red deer in size, this paper hopes to play productively with scale and proximity using a fairly singular object to explore connections between domestic design and mass culture. Both are shown to be reckoning with the paroxysms of industrialization and modernization, reaching for a stability that the river rug ultimately refuses. The river rug was shown at only two exhibitions before disappearing into Voise's home. While this presentation will focus on the reception of the rug at the first of those appearances, the 1903 Arts and Crafts Society exhibition in London, its second showing at the 1904 Louisiana Purchase Exposition in St. Louis, Missouri, is another rich site for comparison and contextualization. I'm showing both the rug itself and a watercolor cartoon here. While the differences in orientation and scale that made their in-person juxtaposition so striking are hard to discern on a slide, I'll be moving between the two versions of the design throughout this presentation, especially when the cartoon offers greater clarity than the rug. Over the course of his 50-year career, CFA Voise attended to nearly every surface in the middle-class English home. He made his first foray into surface design in the 1870s to supplement, his, um, <laughs> to supplement his income as an emerging architect. From these early wallpaper patterns, he quickly established a reputation as a talented and original draftsman whose periods graced wallpaper, printed and woven textiles, and carpets. His design practice later grew to include furniture, metalwork, and ceramics. Across these media, Voise maintained a remarkably consistent hand, bringing light humor, um, I'll point out that this middle piece is titled Let Us Pray, <laughs> 
um, and whimsy to spare rigorously proportioned works. Voisy largely conceived of his design work as an extension of his architectural practice. In a photograph of his bedroom, for example, a fireplace, wallpaper, rug, and furniture of his own design come together to create a space that is austere, but still light and warm. Voisy's work is closely associated with the arts and crafts movement. He was an active member of both the Arts and Crafts Exhibition Society and the Art Workers Guild. This design movement emerged in Britain in the third quarter of the 19th century, in large part out of anxieties around industrialization. Proponents took issue with what they understood to be the aesthetic and social impacts of mechanization, particularly its apparently dehumanizing effect on workers. While Voisy shared his peers' concerns about the moral impact of design, he differed from them in his views on production. He was not overly concerned with the production methods of his designs, how they were reproduced, and he accepted a greater role for machines. He was similarly permissive about the purposes to which his designs were put and the manufacturers to whom he sold them. Voisy was as efficient in his promotional efforts as he was in his draftsmanship. He sold many of his more popular designs to multiple companies, allowing them to be reproduced as both wallpapers and furnishing fabrics. His really adorable um, owl design, for instance, was produced as a furnishing fabric in multiple colorways by Alexander Morton & Co., as well as a wallpaper by Essex & Co. By contrast, only two authorized copies of the river rug are known to have been made, both of very high quality, indicating perhaps a more stake personal stake in the design. A 2016 treatment and cleaning report on the rug in the Victorian Alberts collection revealed its red dye to be fugitive, indicating that this dye, at least, is likely synthetic. More importantly for this paper's considerations of the rug's visual impact on turn-of-the-century audiences, this finding suggests that the rug may have, e may have been even more brightly colored on initial display. These clear, bright colors were a notable shift from the muted tones of, quote, morbid, sickly despondency that many of Voisy's design peers favored and that at least one critic lamented. This was the first of many design conventions that the river rug flouted. Over the second half of the 19th century, British design critics and commentators had worked out a fairly consistent set of rules for carpets to adhere to. First and foremost, designs were to be flat. As an author in the studio's 1906 Yearbook of Decorative Art put it, they should be, quote, free from all suggestion of modeling and surface relief, unquote. This is a more pragmatic phrasing of design reformer Owen Jones's admonition against carpet designs whereon, quote, the feet would fear to tread. Ideal designs were radial, conforming to the studio's suggestion that carpet ornament should never appear upside down from any part of the room. Motifs were to be non-pictorial, either geometric or composed of conventionalized vegetal designs, as the selection of designs shown here, shown here demonstrate. These prescriptions emerged in part from a protective patriotic impulse. French manufacturers excelled in producing the elaborate illusionistic designs against which English critics invade. Even more significantly, I argue here, they developed out of anxieties about the way in which technological change had radically disrupted the apparent honesty of material goods. As cheap imita imitative materials came increasingly to replicate their more expensive antecedents, it became more necessary, in the eyes of design reformers, to emphasize the essential qualities of a given material or object. Charles Eastlake reminded the many readers of his popular advice book, Hints on Household Taste, of, quote, the law that the flat should be decorated with flat ornament, i.e. with designs which either represent a flat surface or whose handling is flat. The river rug, with its exaggerated verticality and suggestion of pictorial space, disregards this pr these prescriptions. But this was not the first time Voisy had presented such an unconventional work. An 1896 reviewer of his similarly pictorial green pastures design indicated that atypicality was rather typical of Voisy. He wrote, quote, Mr. Voisy has enticed us to his point of view so often that possibly after more familiarity, we could accept it as legitimate. But at present, it's, it seems as unorthodox as the use of perspective in wallpapers. 
and although it pleases you aesthetically, it would be too great a shock to one's theory to praise it unreservedly. This sense of being charmed against one's better judgment continues in reviews of the river rug. Reviewers attempted to manage the strangeness of the river rug by transposing it to other forms, attached in turn to different times and places. Writing in the Magazine of Art, critic Amor Valance praised the design as quaint and inventive, but nonetheless concluded that it would be more properly suited for hanging in an upright position, like Aris Tapestry, for example. Aris refers to the Flemish town that was the center of tapestry production in the 15th and 16th centuries. Arts and crafts designers like William Morris and Edward Burne Jones revived Aris tapestry production in the 19th century in conjunction with their broader medievalist project. The photograph on the left here shows a screen with one of their Aris projects exhibited alongside another of Voysey's rugs, confirming Voysey's familiarity with the medium. Any scheme to reorient the rug on the vertical would stabilize the viewer's position to its confounding scene. Remaking it as an Aris tapestry particularly would also emphasize the medievalist visual conventions latent in its design. The late medieval tapestry shown here on the left features elaborately clad figures layered closely upon one another to fit within the strangely shallow picture plane. Distance is compressed and linear perspective is largely disregarded. This disregard was, for turn of the century viewers, characteristic of medieval art. In E.M. Forrester's 1908 novel, A Room with a View, for example, the sanctimonious Mr. Eager is showing a crowd of English tourists around a chapel in Santa Croce, a Florentine church, quote, built by faith in the full fervor of medievalism. Mr. Eager in instructs his flock to, quote, observe how Giotto in these frescoes is untroubled by the snares of anatomy and perspective. In both its subject matter and mode of representation, Boise's river rug demonstrates the conventions of medieval tapestry as turn of the century Britons understood them. It too is untroubled by the snares of perspective with flattened figures viewed from multiple vantage points. The animal figures in particular read like silhouettes pasted atop a tilted background. The scene is bucolic and apparently pre-industrial. A windmill rather than a coal smokestack generates energy. Farmers till their fields with heavy draft animals. The many ships that dot the river are propelled by sails rather than steam engines. These sails, moreover, bear elaborate heraldic crests. These elements fit within the medievalism that art historian Ayla Lapine describes as more of a, quote, glorious heap of material taken up selectively and dexterously, unquote, than an attempt to recreate a specific literal, a specific and literal historical moment. Turn of the century medievalism revealed far more about contemporary Britain than it did about any particular past. This remarkably flexible construction allowed it to function as both a source of imagined stability and continuity and as an ideal that could be contrasted with the ills of the present. Reading the river rug as a medieval tapestry created both perspectival and ideological stability in the industrial age. Another reviewer writing in the studio made sense of the river rug by comparing it to the art of another place. The reviewer describes Voysey's piece as, quote, a hearth rug treated boldly in the pictorial manner, manner, but without scale or perspective, so as to form a kind of Chinese painting, Chinese landscape, sorry. Um, British audiences' knowledge of Chinese painting had expanded dramatically since the 1880s. In 1881, the British Museum acquired Dr. William Anderson's collection of Japanese and Chinese paintings, collected over 13 years of living in Tokyo. This acquisition was an early victory in what cultural historian Ian Shin terms an arms race between the United States and Western European countries around the turn of the century. In this competition, states and individuals collected, sometimes a euphemism, Chinese art to demonstrate both cosmopolitanism and imperial ambition. Anderson's collection was the first to introduce British audiences to Chinese hanging scrolls, a format that tends towards vertical compositions, as well as compressed perspectives. In this Ming Dynasty painting by Chu Yi Ying, for example, a river, suggested by light washes of ink as well as small boats, wends through saturated, vertiginous mountains. 
despite the increased access to Chinese painting in England, Orientalist tropes dogged most period accounts. Works were discussed in mystifying terms that paradoxically collapsed complexity and historical difference, even as they expressed unknowability. One author seems to have inadvertently acknowledged the obfuscating effects of such projections in a 1900 article. China, he writes, remains an enigma. We have dealt with her for centuries and appear to be still unable to diagnose her national temper with any approach to certainty. This author, however, situates that mysteriousness as something intrinsic to China, failing to recognize it as a construction by Western commentators. Literary scholar Gabrielle Lovett summarizes some of these purposes in her discussion of modernist authors' invocations of Chinese material culture. China, she explains, became a sort of panacea, smoothing over the, quote, splintering effects of modernity, unquote, with a comforting vision of unity and teleology. Within these frameworks, a Chinese landscape becomes a singular archetype that might be invoked without further elaboration. Seeing the river rug as a Chinese landscape then, not only restores it to the seemingly appropriate vertical orientation, but also sets it stably within a timeless space of alterity. Whether seen as a medieval tapestry or a Chinese landscape, reviewers sought to fix the river rug physically along a vertical plane and temporospatially elsewhere. Both of these comparisons use the design to evoke a flexible and largely fictitious other against which contemporary Britain might be measured. Scholars have acknowledged this linkage between turn of the century medievalism and Orientalism. Rosie Ibbotson describes the similar function that the two served as, quote, self-defining through distorted comparison, unquote, a reflecting pool in, one, in which one might hope to capture a rapidly changing reflection. T.J. Jackson Lears further characterizes them as closely connected responses to the, quote, crisis of cultural authority, unquote, brought on by rapid changes in technology, transportation, social organization, and consumption. The river rug, however, challenged these comforting displacements as a closer look at its design and presentation at the Arts and Crafts Exhibition Society in 1903 makes clear. The design is not only decidedly for a rug, but also of contemporary Britain. The Arts and Crafts Society's 1903 show was the Society's seventh exhibition. It featured some significant deviations from earlier displays. Most significantly for the river rug, the new gallery's large North Gallery was divided into bays for individual designers, allowing them to stage complete schemes of decoration. A photograph of Voise's section, published in the German periodical Kunst und Kunsthandwerk, shows a compact domestic scene, with two tables and two high-back chairs clustered around an elaborately tiled fireplace. The river rug lies in front of the hearth, stretching nearly the full width of the bay. Although the furniture layered on top of it partially obscured the rug, the full design may be glimpsed in miniature in a framed cartoon that hangs beside the fireplace. This doubling reinforces the importance that the design apparently had for Voise. It also showcases the rug's perplexities of scale and perspective. Where the framed cartoon flirts with the vertical presentation of the rug, the suggestion is slight and tucked in the booth's far corner. The rug, by contrast, nearly fills the floor space. Its material solidity is further enhanced by the numerous chair and table legs that anchor it in place. Voise had no qualms about transferring his designs from one surface to another. He might have easily produced the river rug as a wallpaper, as indeed a reproduction company did in 2020. Voise, however, only ever had the design produced as a thick, plush, handwoven rug. Despite reviewers' attempts to place the design elsewhere or elsewhen, many of its design elements ground it firmly in the present. It oscillates between suggesting the remote and insisting upon the close at hand. For every figure that situates the scene in the past, there is another that returns it to the present day, albeit sometimes circuitously. This is most obvious in the houses depicted on the rug. While produced for his own home, Voise's river rug may be understood as an elaborate calling card for his architectural practice. By the early 1890s, Voise had articulated a highly distinctive style of residential commissions. Age-old traditions of massing and white rough cast surfaces 
met long bands of windows tucked under sizable roofs. Without precisely matching the buildings depicted on the rug to particular commissions, all of the single houses, that is, freestanding country houses, fit this description. One has even been read as Voysey's own home, The Orchard, which he completed in 1901. Another moment of temporal flux and transition in land use may be found in the hunting scene in the upper right corner. The mounted hunters and their hounds seem to be pursuing the stag that rears above them in dramatic silhouette. However, their scarlet coats identify them definitively as fox hunters. Stag hunting declined significantly in England over the latter half of the 18th century as a result of enclosure policies, which portioned previously open areas into smaller and smaller often fenced fields. With this partitioning, hunters turned increasingly to smaller prey, especially foxes. The link between enclosure and fox hunting is memorialized, however inadvertently, in the frequent inclusion of dramatic leaps over fences, gates, and ditches in late, 19th and early 20th, er, late 18th and early 19th century paintings of the pursuit. In the river rug, Voysey's figures leap through a fragmented landscape towards an archaic quarry, chasing the past through the present. The river likewise beats back into the past, even as it portrays a contemporary scene. Amongst the sailing ships and fish and swans that populate the river, two red-hatted figures operate what appears to be a punt, as distinguished by the long pole that one figure uses to push the vessel. While punts have been used for some time as small-scale cargo vessels, they began to be used for pleasure trips along the Thames in the 1860s and reached the zenith of their popularity around the turn of the century. This leisure activity was made significantly more pleasant by infrastructure improvements that reduced pollution in the Thames following the Great Stink of 1858. Rivers have a central place in the formation of national identity. Art historian Tricia Cusack explains that they frequently provide a space for, quote, the merging of past, present, and future in a single stream of history, unquote. The river rug central motif facilitates fluidity between its different temporal indicators. Many design prescriptions were motivated by a need to manage the relationship between the material world and ideology, between reality and its representations. There is no such boundary between the representational world and the real for the river rug. The river rug instead invites one to enter into the virtual space of the depicted scene, to enter into the flux of time and place that its confounding landscape presents. Thank you. Hello everyone, um, I'm John Welchman from the University of California, San Diego, um, and I'd like to echo and underline thanks to Mary Miller and Rebecca Peabody and their wonderful team for making today's event so generous, seamless, and generative, so thanks a lot. Joe Riley is an artist and a historian in our innovative research-based PhD with a concentration in art practice at UCSD and part of the program for interdisciplinary environmental research or PEER at the Scripps uh, Institute of Oceanography on the same campus. Joe's research is organized around the hydropolitics of knowledge, inclusion, and documentation in the ocean sciences the commodification of ocean life forms, such as kelp, and histories of recent and contemporary environmental art practice. Joe's work with the collective Future Farmers has been exhibited at the Bowtie Project in LA, at the Socrates Sculpture Park in New York, at Arte's Munde 7, and at the 13th edition of the Shaja Biennial along with artist Audrey Snyder, who's with us today, and marine ecologist Daniel McCaskill, Joe is part of a Getty Pacific Standard Time project, Oceanographic Art and Science, Navigating the Pacific, about which more in a minute. 
Joe has a BFA from the Cooper Union School of Art in New York. He was a fellow with the TBA 21 Academy's Open Space in Venice, Italy, and a participant in the Whitney Independent Study Program, again in New York City. Welcome, Joe. Thank you, John, for that very kind introduction and to everyone at GRI for hosting us here today. Um, I'd like to first note a slight title change for this presentation um, that uh, perhaps moves us into an environmental framework rather than and, and a little bit out of an eco-logic. This talk is an element of a project called Passengers of Change a collaboratory that's comprised of myself, artist and chef Audrey Snyder, and marine ecologist Daniel McCaskill. Together we are designing and building a platform we call Ballast Bench, an instrument that is part observation tank and part tool for studying Andaria pinnidifida, a globally migratory form of seaweed variously characterized as either a colonizing force or as an opportunistic passenger of ecosystem change. When I use we, are, and us, Throughout this talk, it's in grateful acknowledgement of Audrey and uh, Danielle, and I think it's also a nod to the seaweed that we gather around. Sp and special thanks um, to Audrey for helping with many of the drawings that you'll see in this presentation. To understand our collaboratory and the design of our study of Andaria in the form of a bench, specifically weighted by liquid ballast that doubles as the medium in which Andaria is promulgated and observed, I'm going to move through accounts of marine algae and maritime ballast as counterparts of political, economic, and environmental change. I'll begin by describing fieldwork undertaken in the project, and then I'll touch on some historical and theoretical questions and draw connections not only to scientific and environmental concerns, but also to recent and contemporary art practices that inform the project's research methods. Towards the end of the talk, we'll return to the design of the ballast bench, which will be exhibited next year as a contribution to UC San Diego's Getty Pacific Standard Time exhibition. On a morning in the spring of 2021, Audrey and I joined marine ecologist Daniel McCaskill at the channelized entrance to Mission Bay in San Diego, California. We put on wetsuits, snorkels, diving masks, and dove to search for the seaweed Andaria pinnidifida eventually accumulating a briny tangle to bring back to the laboratory at Scripps Institu Institution of Oceanography, where Danielle is working on a long-term scientific analysis of how Andaria had arrived and come to thrive on San Diego's coast. Commonly known as the edible seaweed wakame, Andaria is endemic to the coastal waters of Japan, where for centuries it has featured prominently in food and literature and is the briny fruit of large-scale aquacultural operations. Since at least the second half of the 20th century, Andaria have been, found out, have been found out of place in increasing abundance throughout coastal regions of the Mediterranean, Europe, Australia, and the Americas, all places where it is considered a non-native or invasive seaweed. Andaria is counted among the world's 100 most invasive organisms, prompting debates on whether this macroalgae should be considered a passenger or a driver of ecosystem change in areas where it is introduced, takes up residence, or is said to invade. Andaria may be a driver of change if its presence is understood to negatively impact a particular marine eco ecosystem. Alternatively, Andaria's arrival in a new bioregion could have negligible impacts by filling pre-existing gaps in an ecological niche, thus acting as a passenger of environmental dynamics. As is the case with many out-of-place organisms, the question of labeling and containing Andaria is contextual and fraught. So that's why our work um, focuses on the environmental and political complexity of Andaria's uh, relationship to migration, indigeneity, and change. Terms like non-native and invasive are caught up in a complex nexus of material and signifying variables, including borders and properties, narratives of progress and settlement and extinction. When we consider an out-of-place organism like Andaria, it's easy to fall back on a, the tendency to relate to place as a fixed location, typically on land. 
but engagement with errant marine species can complicate the association of place with land, property, and fixed locales by bringing into a relief a distinctly unfixed and fluid place, the Earth's ocean. With ocean dynamics in mind, we ask how and why these seaweeds have been said to invade and why they are characterized in the research as being like the ocean itself coming in waves. Named after the Latin term unda, meaning wave, undaria is distinguished by its curving or undulating blades, which have been likened to visual representations of wave forms. Mobilizations of marine invasive creatures, militaries, social movements, economies, and even pandemics are likewise described as undulatory phenomena. Common parlance refers to swelling numbers of non-native species and receding rates of biodiversity, surges of COVID-19 case counts, waves of political protest and revolution, and martial attacks and counterattacks. Conquests and invasions are not only shaped like waves, but also occur over waves. The amphibious uh, military invasions of World War II were influenced by appraisals of when surf on the beaches in Normandy and Iwo Jima would be suitable for launching tremendous seaborne military invasions. Decades later, the cyclone associated with the Fukushima nuclear disaster released staggering amounts of debris carried by wind and waves across the Pacific from Japan to the coastline of North America. These materials that washed up on, the US, on US Pacific beaches introduced hundreds of species, including Andaria, and raised alarm over new surges of non-human invasion. As a species traveling through, with, and over all manner of waves, Andaria directs our attention to the tensions and slippages between the structures of a coast and the form and agency of a seaweed. Andaria doesn't travel from coast to coast on its own. It requires a medium and a container to move great distances. The Andaria that we encountered in Mission Bay likely arrived there in the liquid ballast of ocean crossing ships. So that prospect led our collaboratory in two directions. It prompted us to design an instrument that creates waves and simulates the medium of liquid ballast and to pursue a critical historical account of ballast in coastal Southern California. The waves of conquest and colonization of California crested on a coastal point in San Diego, the apex of what is today called Point Loma. For thousands of years, uh, indigenous peoples utilized a Mat Kunili or Mat Loan, as this uh, location is known in Kumie, to access the kelp forest ha habitats that run parallel to the coastline and served as abundant sources of food and thoroughfares for human and animal migration. Fire affected rock piles on the eastern side of the point indicate its long durational use as a site for drying and roasting harvested aquatic plants and animals. In the 16th century, the Spanish began calling this part of the peninsula La Punta de los Grijaros, the point of cobblestones, referring to the abundant smooth stones strewn across the beach, which mariners considered ideal for use as ship's ballast. Subsequent generations of settlers called the site Ballast Point and exploited it as a primary source of weighty materials necessary for keeping ships stable and right side up on the long stormy return voyages to the Eastern US and Western Europe. It may seem counterintuitive, but ships must be weighed down to stay afloat. For centuries, laborers and sailors collected stones, conceivably including those used by Kumie for food preparation and processing from Ballast Point. Those stones were carried away in the cargo holds of merchant ships and discharged in distant ports, discarded as waste, or repurposed as a building material. It's said that stones from San Diego's Ballast Point paved water and milk streets in Boston, Massachusetts. So when mariners collected ballasts, the accumulated material included local soil and seeds. Discharged at a faraway port, these seeds might remain in the aggregate and soil for decades before taking root. For the artist Maria Teresa Alves, the displaced plants that lie dormant or insurgent in ballast are critical matter for the study of colonialism, slavery, and the global commerce of goods. Alves's project, Seeds of Change, attends specifically to the growth of ballast flora brought by ships on the return voyage to the major slave trading ports of Europe. Enfolding critical ethnobotany, history, and art practice, Alves creates lists, maps, and gardens of ballast flora to visualize these deracinated but living archives of racial capitalism and colonialism. As Jill Cassid suggests, the latent and scattered ballast flora in Alves's work perforate colonial diagrams of conquest 
and countermap the recursive processes and technologies of settler colonialism so that the life of displaced plants lend agency to the otherwise dead weight of solid, solid ballast in the holds of ships. A dead weight, we might note, which underwrote the antimonies of capitalist accumulation in modernity through disposability, unequal distribution of human value, and profit-making social deaths transited through the slave trade and indigenous dispossession. But thinking through these histories with ballast is challenged by a technological state change of ballast from solid to liquid in the 20th century. If Alves's work can be understood to bear witness to the ballasted histories of a materially and metaphorically solid modernity, how then have artists negotiated the unique political and environmental metamorphosis wrought by the modifications of transoceanic shipping in a more recent and perhaps more fluid modernity? During the long 20th century, ocean crossing ships were increasingly ballasted by the same stuff that a floating vessel displaces, which is liquid water. Fluid ballast is a crucial yet often overlooked technological influence of post-war globalization, helping to drive unprecedented changes in shipping and logistics alongside the coinciding rise of liquid fossil fuels and containerization. The artist and historian Alan Sekula, whose extensive papers are held in GRI special collections, was among the earliest artists to visualize globalization as, a, uh, as both social and, and a environmental phenomena. In essayistic assemblages of prose and photographic hin images hinging between art and documentary, Sekula tracked the technical and political economic processes of marine industries and environments. His approach has been described as a form of critical realism in which reality is expressed notationally and through nuanced articulations of commonality and difference across natural and social regimens. In his late career works, Sekula scrutinized how maritime transmutations of global capitalism radically altered relations of ocean life and, re and redefined the sea as an in-between space. His 2010 essay film, The Forgotten Space, co-directed with Noel Birch, uses shipping containers as a central subject and metaphor to stage a critical expression of rapidly changing seascapes. In the film, these ubiquitous modular units circumscribe and displace people who live and work on the edges of global commerce and encase and conceal nearly all the world's commodities. A disappearing and displacing act that is reinforced by sequences of containers in transit moving through logistical panoramas that appear entirely devoid of even the barest signs of life. The Forgotten Space is based on an earlier artwork, uh, Fish Story, which is comprised of a prismatic collection of uh, photographs and essays on a range of historical and aesthetic valences, technologies, and economic relations, which all together socially construct the sea. Despite its piscine title, there is a uh, conspicuous absence of fish in Fish Story, much less any of the diverse organisms populating the forgotten ocean space. It is a deliberate, if ironic, omission that indexes a catastrophic negation of marine life vis-a-vis -vis the vessels of globalization. The critical distance between maritime, socio-technical, and marine environmental worlds established in the forgotten space, Fish Story, and other works underscores Sukula's apprehension of environmental and ecological discourses as, a, as symbolic systems inseparable from human, social, political, and economic structures. In these projects, and especially in Sukula's archives and dozens of notebooks, we can begin to see the outlines of a critical environmental realism taking shape. It contests fate accompli disaster narratives of oil spills, melt melting polar ice, and sea level rise through a steadfast critique of environmental sea changes freighted by container, propelled by bunker fuel, and buoyed by ballast tanks. Sekula's up-close scrutiny of ships and shipping containers resonates with Walter Benjamin's understanding of the 19th century Paris arcades as vestiges of commodity capitalism and frameworks for uh, a radical uh, political critique. In Sekula's imagery, cargo ships and containers are the uh, allegorical cultural form par excellence of late 20th and early 21st century globalization. And yet these machines Social elisions and environmental entanglements also represent uh, moments and possibilities of rupture in the panorama of maritime and maritime space. 
Maria Teresa Alves's work with Ballast Flora in Seeds of Change stages a similar, if more direct environmental critique using the strewn matter of solid ballast and the weeds and flowers extant in the wayscapes of colonial era trade. Our project, Passengers of Change, takes these methods a step further through collaborative and multi-species perspectives on the technical recursions of transoceanic shipping and its impacts on intertidal ecologies. By studying and countermapping Andaria's distribution and settlement patterns, we can show how the material and symbolic melting of ballast compelled and continues to compel new conditions and relations of life in coastal environments. The particular relationship between algae and ballast thus offers a framework to visualize and to critically apprehend capital's exchange of stabilizing forces for lighter, more fluid modes of accumulation, which profit intensely from continuous dissolution of social and environmental connections. Liquid ballast has been characterized as a vector of change that raises the environmental stakes of maritime capital by accelerating the circulation of non-native marine organisms. As larger and larger liquid ballasted cargo ships arrived in ports to traffic in ever greater volumes of cargo, vessels would discharge an indeterminable fluid mixture, something like a transoceanic soup comprised of seawater, suspended sediments, and small organisms. Dock workers, fishers, and zoologists began recognizing new marine organisms arriving and thriving in coastal waters of port cities in the early 20th century. Although it wasn't until containerization emerges as a globalizing force in the 1970s um, that marine scientific literature begins to identify ballast water as the primary medium of these coastal invasions. Today there is general agreement among scientists that Andaria's widespread distribution accompanies the expansion of maritime shipping in the post-war era. But there's little in the way of substantiated data describing how global shipping st actually structures the seaweed spread. Our collaborative has gathered around this question, literally and figuratively swimming with Andaria in impacted waterways and through lab experiments that recreate the conditions of liquid ballast tanks. We've previously observed that Andaria tends to settle on disturbed human impacted coastal structures like Mission Bay's jetty. Andaria is a seaweed that, um, that seems to thrive in artificial and stressful conditions, including perhaps the dark holds of ballast tanks. Andaria has been an agent and a companion of our collaborative, accompanying our underwater dives, our research in laboratories and archives and through writing and through making. And yet we're also wary of um, assigning an unmediated agency to this seaweed or, or perhaps overemphasizing its flexibility and mobility. As a seaweed uh, topping lists of invasive organisms and consistently evading interventions aimed at slowing or eradicating its proliferation, Andaria could be too easily misrepresented or misunderstood as an ideal non-human subject of a liquid modernity. So the limits of trying to uh, fix Andaria uh, are clear, and that's why our work has engaged in a twisting and a folding of an array of symbolic matter and visual, visual research spanning the studio, laboratory, ocean, and archives. By visualizing Andaria and ballast, we have unwound an important but decidedly non-spectacular scientific question into a practice of bringing together multiple histories, places, creatures, and forms of knowledge. We've learned to take cues from Andare's latency, its wandering, and even its errantry, as Edouard Guisson uh, might have put it. Andaria can be seen as an errant algae, prompting disciplinary wandering between artists and scientists in the study of biological and historical processes of colonization. It has provoked, uh, it's also provoked thinking about ballast, global trading networks, the portability of a wet laboratory bench where data are produced and analyzed, and where algae may be apprehended as drivers or passengers of change. These experiences have guided our design of an experimental sculpture instrument that we call the ballast bench. Roughly the size of a public park bench, ballast bench borrows its hybrid form from the laboratory bench and the ballast tank. Its elliptically curved bottom causes the whole object to, to go into a back and forth motion, motion when a person sits on top. Imagine a rocking chair that kind of sounds like a waterbed. The, the bench's audible but optically invisible contents are dozens of gallons of seawater inoculated with hundreds of Andaria sporophytes and gametophytes. 
It's a simulated liquid ballast and a medium for an experimental study of the microscopic stages of Andaria over the temporal course of a ocean crossing ship's passage, a time span which is clocked within the duration of an art exhibition. So when people sit atop and rock the bench back and forth, they're mimicking the pitch and roll of a ship, making waves inside a concealed world. Bench sitters are passengers of a marine scientific experiment through which the survival and reproduction rates of tiny invasive algae spores under these ballast tank conditions are monitored and, monitored and tracked in a scientific analysis that cross-references the survival and growth of Andaria inside the bench with those out in the field at sites like Mission Bay. The ballast bench gives form to the question and matters of exchange and transference in and across oceans and between human and non-human systems. As a component of passengers of change, it points to a proliferation of marine invasive species carried and displaced in coastal waters of San Diego as an, as an, an, as an extension of the systems of water, land, and resource expropriation established by colonial regimes and expanded under modern globalization. Ocean crossing works by artists like Alves and Sukula further inform the project's alignment of the pressures um, of institutional forces, questions of creative agency, critical histories, and symbiot symbiotic associations. Their examples also remind us to take care to differentiate the colonial and capitalist imaginaries of invasion, expropriation, and liquidation of life and land and seascapes from the relations of invasive and non-native species. Peripatetic study of an organism like Andaria has helped us to do so and to pursue a loosening of disciplinary boundaries between art and science across human and non-human interests without hopefully over-essentializing or reducing either to the other. Thanks. Thank you, Taylor, Anna, and Joe, for three really fascinating papers. I'd like to invite you all back to the stage now, along with Miguel DeBaca, who will be moderating our discussion. Miguel DeBaca is Senior Program Officer at the Getty Foundation. He received his PhD from Harvard in 2009 and BA in 2002 from Stanford, and in 2017 and 18 was Terra Foundation Visiting Professor of American Art at the University of Oxford. He is active in the Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellowship Program Network as a former MMUF Fellow and advisor to their Graduate Initiatives Program at the Social Science Research Council. DeBaca's publications include a 2015 monograph on minimalist sculptor Ann Truitt, and the 2016 edited volume, Conflict, Identity, and Protest in American Art. He is responsible for the Foundation's Connecting Art Histories grants, among other initiatives. Welcome. Thank you all so much for uh, these very interesting papers that, in fact, uh, despite being very disparate or diverse in terms of their subjects and uh, time periods, chronologies, um, notwithstanding have so much to say about something like proximity, the idea of proximity. And um, I was thinking about that word, proximity, and its Latin root in propi, which means something which is near, but then the various ways that that gets spun out. So with words like propinquity, which could even mean kinship that is established by, uh, by one's relationship in nearness to something else. Anyway, I was thinking about all these things as you were, were speaking, and uh, it really, I think, was something that was, uh, is a, is a topic that each of you alighted upon. Um, and one other proximal thing is approximation. Uh, it strikes me, for instance, that archeology, span even though it's scientific, is also an approximation. Um, that even in science, there's things that are unknown and approximated. Um, and, uh, and there's so much about approximation in the rather psychedelic, more on which to come, uh, relationships of perspective and scale 
that uh, was addressed in Anna's paper as well. So uh, at the risk of redundancy, um, could you all just, while the crowd is sort of generating their questions, um, alight upon or meditate briefly on this idea of proximity or approximation that uh, is in each of your projects? Can you hear me? Okay. I guess I can go first because I was the first one. Um, yeah, I, this is a really good question. I think that with archaeological photographs, they both give us a false sense of proximity and that, you know, it's right here. You can see the details more clearly than you may think that you can see them in person. It allows you to revisit sites that you are no longer in proximity to. Um, but that's, a, you know, it's this false sense of proximity um, as a result. Um, the photograph itself distances from the material, from the materiality, um, and from the broader context of the archaeological material. Um, but then again, when you're in the archive and you're viewing these things and using archaeological photographs as the point of study, um, that itself is a proximate relationship as well. So um, re-engaging um, these images through proximity with them, with them. Cool. Okay. Um, thank you for this question, and that's definitely been a byword thinking through this project. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, I think there's some temporal and also some spatial proximity things that I've been thinking through with this rug. One of which, um, starting with the temporal, is that it's still a rug that I think looks really strange to us now. Um, like it's just a funny object. And a lot of this project has been trying to think through why was it strange in 1903 and is that the same reason that it's strange now? Um, and those sorts of, what are those readings based on? Um, and I think a lot of what makes it so strange, particularly in this 1903 context, is the spatial proximity and the way in which it's it presents a space that you're supposed to enter into and that discomfort of, um, of crossing over between this represented world and being in it while also being outside of it. Thanks. Joe, in a second, we'll get to you. I just want to kind of push on that a little bit because when I was looking at that rug, the word psychedelic did come to mind. Um, because isn't it the case that one under the influence of psychedelic drugs uh, experiences something like proximity and nearness all at the same time, uh, which is what this object is also uh, doing. And I was really struck, I wrote down as you were speaking, the two opposites become one the far away and the familiar, the earth underneath our feet and the earth in our imagination. So the actual space of one inhabiting that room is also in tension with, in a way, forming an image of that natural environment which can then become a site of uh, possession or territorialization or any number of things. Yeah, totally. I'm mean, uh, hypothetically regarding the psychedelic experience, but um, I think that is, you know, hugely part of what I find interesting about it. Um, and there's a, a sort of third section that ended up on the cutting room floor, but thinking about this as a touristic panorama, which are, you know, circulating so widely in London at the time. Um, and scholar Allison Clark has some really wonderful work talking about touristic panoramas and the sort of uh, pleasurable experience that they create in having a doubling of the self, where there's you know yourself that's sitting on the fairground ride or sitting up against the railing, and then the projected self that's in this um, you know sometimes aerial but like very large. Um, view and that sort of like possessive view um, and the way that that rug does it at a sort of not microscopic certainly but much smaller scale a much more intimate scale thank you i 
I want to get to Joe, I, and I'm going to do that by going through, again, the psychedelic, which is to say that when you showed, there was a moment in your presentation where you showed the earth in the kind of classic blue marble aerial from space view. And something that's always struck me about those ways of seeing the earth is that the earth that we look at is like brown and green and, but when you kind of pull back and see it all as one, so to speak, then it turns into this blue thing. And, I, and maybe that's not that big of a deal, but I think that it is a big deal to think about how we, the, the, Im, the image of the earth versus the inhabited experience of it um, and that also being a kind of interesting tension that your project is exploring. The uh, tab of acid I took right after lunch is starting to hit right now, so <laughs> see how this goes. Um, just kidding. Um, maybe I'll, I'll start with proximity as a way to get into that because there's a kind of distance that is involved with uh, <laughs> that, uh, the blue marble view. Um, for me, proximity is a, uh, so maybe it's, I, I, I like to think of it as, as license to do a lot of boundary crossing and bridge building, maybe between some of the uh, knowledge making procedures of, that are, you know, disciplinarily situated. And um, so, and what I mean by that is, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in the co-production of knowledge between artists and scientists and historians and how, um, you know, uh, rather than say, um, some of the, the kind of um, the, the interdisciplinary proximities, quote unquote, that um, tend to be sort of founded on a need to know basis of um, you know, information between from one area or one field to another. Um, and that, you know, I guess the, the blue marble view is in some ways um, a little bit of a, a joke on you know marine scientists and oceanographers when they give a TED talk they, they love to say you know we know more about the world's oceans than we do about outer space right or no we know less about the world's oceans than we do about outer space excuse me um, and uh, and that you know that harkens back to this you know 60s 70s moment of the whole Earth catalog and the uh, the question of uh, Stuart Brand question of why haven't we seen an image of the whole Earth yet um, and so trying to to, to maybe reach uh, those proximities uh, is what I'm, yeah, I'm very interested in. Thank you, and I'm also reminded in that exact comment, speaking about the 60s and 70s, how psychedelic culture, I'll stop after this, <laughs> is, uh, is also involved in, uh, like, you know, Timothy Leary at Stanford or something, is also involved in the birth of cybernetics and computer science, and so this sort of interdisciplinarity as a kind of proximity is something that I think your project uh, is uncovering beautifully. Um, out to the crowd. Yeah, Amy, I saw your hand first. Oh yeah, I, I think we have to wait for the, yes, for the mic, okay. Hi, Amy Ogata, USC. Um, I'm really interested, I wanna maybe take your idea of proximity and recast it as representation. And I think that's what something that's shared in all the papers. Um, we're representing architecture in, in, in wool. We have the ruin or the archeological site in photography. We have the, the, the wave bench, the ocean actually as furniture. And I wondered about um, what you think uh, is, are the local politics of those shifts? of scale, of medium, of materials uh, that you would see um, that each of your projects, in a sense, asks us to, to consider? Um, thank you so much for that question, Amy. Um, thinking through these sort of fluctuations of representation, I guess on the very small scale of this rug um, and like uh, the maker, CFA Voise, something that I'm interested in is that this is a piece that went into his own house and then is sort of representing his architectural practice and that permeability between his personal and his professional realm. 
um, and the way in which that's done through this sort of almost recursive representations of his houses. Um, and then again, I think sort of at the crux of this is this, um, maybe crisis is too strong of a word, but it's, it's in that realm um, of representation that's happening in design over the second half of the 19th century and thinking about that maybe instability or potential dishonesty of objects um, that creates the need for these strong rules and strong design prescriptions. Um, and this in being a rug that is also a river that is also houses, um, you know, confounds that. Um, for me, one of the interesting parts of your question is that you first started out talking about the representation of ruins and then you corrected yourself and said archeological material. Um, and I really think that in these photographs, like at the turn of the 20th century, it is a representation of ruins, right? Like they're replicating other representations of romantic ideas of ruins, um, French romantic painting, French orientalist paintings, those sorts of things. Um, and it isn't until, you know, archeology span starts to become more professionalized in some ways, um, right around the beginning of the 20th century, but it gets more so, you know, as we progress in time, that these things stop looking like ruins and they start looking like more boring. <laughs> um, you know, we have pictures of dirt, we have pictures of holes, we have up close images of detailed things, we have images of artifacts isolated from their surroundings. Um, but these two are representations of you know, previous ways of representing this stuff, right? Um, artifact photographs look exactly like artifact drawings dating to the antiquarian period. So this act of representing the archeological material is you know, really grounded in these ideas about how we represent this stuff anyway. And they're all, um, you know, it's all, it's all moral judgment, right? Like the act of photographing something instead of drawing it so that it looks more um, objective um, is saying something, right? Saying something about what archeology span is. Archeology span is a science. Archeology span is not just people collecting stuff, even though, you know, at that time, what was antiquarian and what was archeology span is much blurrier. Um, and so I really think that like photography um, and the objectivity or purported objectivity of photography really helps archeology span make the case that it is, you know, not these images of ruins, um, as you say, but it's, you know, objective documentation, archeology span is a science, um, which again, it has its own baggage. Um, I hope that answers. The um, practices or modes of representation that um, I'm really quite interested in, uh, which are you know exemplified in Sekul's work and Alves and s numerous other artists, is um, you know a, a constellatory approaches to representation, sometimes you know referred to as you know essay-based practices or montage or collage or whatever it may be, and um, uh, I think that those um, approaches to uh, visualization and representation um, are useful for, particularly for you know, a kind of complex, difficult to access to see kind of um, organism or phenomena like the proliferation of Andaria and numerous other invasive species because it, it's a, it's a, it allows for bringing in heterogeneous phenomena, objects, histories, uh, materials, to, in order to arrive at a very specific and concentrated place, right? Um, rather than, um, like I was trying to allude to at the end of the talk, rather than just starting from a place of uh, an essentialized or distilled object. Before we move on to a uh, question to the gentleman in the back, um, Taylor, the, forgive me, I maybe, these are photographs by French, Frenchmen, but they are printed in Tunisia? Yes, so it, it depends. Um, so the postcards are made in a photographic studio from Tunisia. Um, some of the stuff 
it's a little kind of iffy depending on like in terms of like records attached to individual images within the archive. Um, some things were printed in France, um, but there were photographic studios set up in Indonesia as kind of like an infrastructure um, for producing these images. Thank but, you. But yeah, mostly French photographers. Well, I think that that's, uh, Amy, thinking about representation, I think that's really important to think about the contexts of the photographer and where the objects were produced and printed and how many different hands were on the photographs as they moved through the studio. Well, yeah, and just to add on to that, like not only the identity of the photographer as French or Tunisian or et cetera, um, but the identity of the photographer as an archeologist or as an artist or as a photographer. Okay, question in the back. Uh, Sven Speaker from UC Santa Barbara. Um, I have a question primarily for the last speaker, Joe, I believe. Um, I enjoyed your paper very much, thank you. Um, I was a bit surprised and wanted to press, a little, press you a little bit on the dialogue and conversation between scientists and artists. Um, you've presented this dialogue as rather seamless and um, easy, when in actual fact scientists and artists um, pursue, even if they may both be after knowledge, um, pursue very different means and ways of arriving at that knowledge. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more maybe about the difficulties that you encountered as you were working with these scientists, working presumably on the same material and doing experiments of their own. Now their experiments, I imagine, were very different from the ones that you showed us. Um, although in some other ways they may also be quite similar. Now I realize I am, this is a question that probably way overburdens you and your talk that, that is much more general than probably it should be. But I was wondering, looking for common territory, one term that you didn't bring up but that could easily be brought up in this context is the question of the medium. I mean obviously the question of the medium you know, when you're looking at the ocean is, is important, but it's also important for artists, right? I mean, it's not a coincidence that Alan Sekula works with photography, and that was obviously a, very, an, a medium that he chose with great deliberation. So I wonder if in answering the question, the problem of the medium uh, and its materiality uh, could be a useful um, uh, point of departure. And that, of course, could also actually then be extended to the other speakers because the problem of the medium, in some ways, perhaps, is more pertinent than the one of representation in this context. But um, uh, yeah, that's that's my comment or question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and um, uh, you know, for. Uh, one of the, the, the things that initially pops into my head is um, the work of our, our, uh, our colleague in Santa Barbara, Melody Jew, um, whose work, uh, book Wild Blue Media, which is um, about the, the mediation uh, of the ocean, um, and that, is, that has really informed um, uh, my research. Um, but you're right that uh, these collaborations and interactions between artists and scientists are certainly uh, not seamless, not without tensions, not without frictions um, and antagonisms at times. Um, and um, uh, what I have found, what, what I have learned uh, from you know, my colleagues in the sciences is that there are incredible creative practices that happen in the context of laboratories, right? Uh, that don't necessarily get uh, uh, you know, um, uh, described maybe as, um, as such. Um, and so you know, in order to, 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 to arrive at those kinds of you know, uh, shared moments around creativity, around uh, working with uh, media or um, or a particular medium, let's say, um, I think it, uh, it it takes a lot of will on all sides, so to speak, uh, to uh, proceed at the uh, speed of trust, right? Um, and it's you know it's something that you'll see if you look maybe towards. Um, uh, literature and anthropology and ethnography, right? The kind of deep hanging out that um, is, is uh, practiced and, and brought to the fore in contemporary ethnographic methods is something that um, I look to quite often. Um, the, this project is part of a, um, a PST project, which is um, 
you know, an, involved with it. There's 10 different groups that each has an artist, a scientist, and a historian in it. Um, and uh, not all of those uh, collaborations have, you know, produced, um, uh, produced artworks or chapters or whatever, but there, um, there has almost been some kind of a knowledge making um, uh, that comes out of it, right? And sometimes it comes out in the negative. It comes out uh, through conflict and through um, certain antagonisms. Other comments, auditor, okay. Um, yes, a question, Andrew. I think, it's very, it's hard to see how. No, well done, I think. So this question was inspired by Anna's talk, but I hope that it relates to all three papers, which is about the relationship between the aesthetic and the industrial, and perhaps the pressure of industrialization I noticed that the river rug was hand knotted and most of the other ones you showed us by him were machine knotted. But at the same time, as you said, from the fugitive red dye, it was using uh, a synthetic dye, which is one of the major industries of the 19th century. And then that whole relationship between arts and crafts and industrialization. So I wonder if you, could say a little bit more about that, and then um, I think similarly um, the introduction to photography and to archaeology, and and Joe's talk obviously had had very similar things about um, the role of the industrial, both in the making of the objects and in the environmental impacts. Yeah, thank you so much for that question, Andrew. I feel like industrialization is really such a driving force in this exploration. Um, as you're noting in this sort of arts and crafts rejection of industrialization and this sort of dislike, that's too mild a word, um, <laughs> rejection of the labor conditions that that produces or seems to produce um, is, yeah, I mean, that's I think really key in a lot of these design conversations that this rug is coming out of. Um, and then speaking about this one more particularly, as you noted, it's hand knotted. Um, uh, Voise did produce a small number of rugs with, with Wilton or Yates and Co. It changed names a couple times um, that are hand knotted. Um, but as noted, unlike many of his peers in the arts and crafts um, movement, he's pretty comfortable with a lot of machine production. Um, and so that I think is one of the ways in which he gets talked about as the sort of person who's pushing that design dialogue in a different direction and pushing it not to get too much into the teleology, but towards, um, towards more modernism. Um, as a sort of like fun fact that I'm still figuring out what to do with, um, he only had two copies of this rug made. One of them was for his own home. But his grandson has speculated based on um, patterns that he sold that he sold the pattern for people who were who wanted to weave the rug like in their own homes, but was very, very strict about not letting it go to anybody else who was going to have it manufactured. Um, and so I think Voise is also walking this dance here and like in a sort of exceptional way with this rug um, of wanting it to be a handmade object. Yeah, I mean, your question kind of gets to the heart of um, this question within my project of, you know, what's the difference between the archival image and the um, image that's produced for mass consumption, whether that be, you know, popular images or also those images that are produced in um, texts um, and in archaeological publications about the site. Because, you know, while I did spend a great deal of time talking, and this is, you know, a a loose interpretation of industrial <laughs> industrialization. But while I did spend a good deal of time on these images of archeological labor, these are not the images that people are seeing of um, archeological sites even today in archeological publications, right? We see the cleaned up images, um, the detailed shots. There are no people, there are no tools, there are no, um, nothing going on besides just the archeological material that you are trying to make an argument about. Um, and the same case is largely true for images that are, you know, public facing, trying to create ideas about the images as ruins. Um, 
And so there's this disconnect. Um, and in the archive, we see these documentary images, um, which can supplement our understandings of how archaeology worked in this time. Um, but they're functioning in a quite a different way, right? Because they're not being published. They're not produced for mass consumption. Um, they're produced more in terms of, you know, documenting the actual process of it. So it's, there, there's a divide there. Joe, you want to weigh in? I think it was for all three. Or, but don't, oh. don't feel, if you don't want to, don't feel like you <laughs> ought to. I would love to hear another question. Okay, that's, that's very fair. I think I saw here, uh, yeah. I'm Bisa Rapanchova at oh, Stanford sorry. University. And so I have, maybe this is a good moment. These were three excellent talks, but I have a question to Joe, and he didn't have a chance to answer, so the question comes. And I'm interested in your position, your understanding of the power of opa opacity, opacity. You're working with opacity. I found extremely impressive and powerful the way uh, there is a silent video and we hear you speak, uncovering something that is invisible and uncovering this invisible agency, which to me has also an incredible potential about political activism, environmental activism. So where do you stand on that? And in the way of which subtly, in a sense, integrating different medium, media in order to uncover something that has a very powerful message. Thank you for that question. Um, and I think that's such a vital, um, uh, a vital position to bring into the room um, because the, um, uh, in the US American context, at least as I read it, the environmental humanities writ large are by and large situated in um, literature and also in the social sciences. And um, although there are really, there is really amazing work that's sometimes coded as eco-critical art history um, that uh, calls on um, historians and also artists to, um, to, uh, to, 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 to bring their work and uh, to craft it in order to make interventions in um, environmental and climate crises. Um, that's something that I think that maybe um, art history as a field has a, has a lot of work remaining to do. Um, and that's something that, um, you know, I always try to keep in mind and it's a real motivating factor um, for, for my work. Um, not only, um, you know, uh, when it has to do with working in archives, but it also has to do with, you know, working in the field, right? Um, and, uh, uh, and coming into close proximity with um, uh, some of these, with, uh, the, the, with our collaborators who are also not only human entities, but also um, things, as, uh, things like algae, right? That are, um, you know, considered to be, uh, 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 out of place or, you know, in the wrong place. Um, and I think that, but, you know, part of my dissertation looks at um, uh, how uh, a sort of latent or truncated environmentalism vis-a-vis um, -vis in Sekula's work. Um, and I'm, I'm still working through that, <laughs> you know? Um, and that's, I guess it's at early stages of the research, but um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I, there has not been a lot of, there's not an environmental reading of um, Sukula's work, or even uh, in uh, essayistic and uh, photographic practices in general. Yeah, I mean, I think, pertaining to Sukula, I, you know, the, I think it's, um, his interest is in the deleterious effects of capitalism um, and finding deep mutual connections between, so for example, in the archive here at Getty, um, diary entries from Sekula writing about the uprisings after Rodney King was killed and um, expressing, th I think he was talking about how uh, indebted business owners were also burning down their businesses at the same time. And in just this kind of casual remark, you can see this attempt to kind of link the, um, through, through capitalistic exploitation, 
the, the plight of many of the people who live in these areas and the extractive practices of, the, of, of real estate um, in the same, at the same time. So anyway, I, it, it is, I think, in any case there, this activist um, impulse. But I'm gonna ask a cheeky question, which is what should art historians do then to be more eco, I don't, let's not call it eco-critical, let's call it something more interesting, but what, what should we be doing? This is the part where I just say, well, I'm just a big dumb artist, I don't know, <laughs> you figure it out, um, which is not true, that's, that's a, um, um, so I think that there are, um, really interesting um, models, uh, particularly in um, like multi-species multi studies, particularly that is as it's situated. And, you know, um, folks have brought that into the room and you know, uh, earlier with um, discussion, Karen Barad was, was raised, right? Um, but um, what I, um, uh, where am I going? Um, um, I think that it, 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 what, what is necessary is for, um, uh, what should we do? Um, it, there's, there's something disarming about that question, right? Because, you know, it's, um, it's, 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 some, it's somewhat overwhelming, like uh, in, in the sense, much in the same way that um, climate crises are um, entirely uh, overwhelming, world-changing, and shifting um, uh, phenomena. And what I think is absolutely necessary is for um, artists and historians to um, reconfigure methods um, in, you know, in order to meet with the way in which we are all disarmed <laughs> by that question, right? And that takes, um, that takes a, for me at least, that has manifested in, in doing a lot of uncomfortable things of literally going into, into labs and into uh, f field sites and um, really trying to, and, and also working um, across uh, in what we might call anti-colonial um, sciences, right? Which is not the same as a decolonial science, but um, and an another important thing that I think is absolutely um, necessary, and we're reminded of this by uh, Wen Yang and Eve Tuck in the essay, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, that, um, uh, that our, uh, insofar as our works are uh, invoking post and decolonial um, uh, uh, language, that um, we're also uh, doing that materially, like in our practices, whether and whatever, how are those practices manifest, right? Um, and that is absolutely a crucial step in um, addressing environmental crises. Thank you. I saw, an, okay, yes. Thank you all for three fascinating papers. I have a question more involved with methodology. You're all working with archives in some sense, and since we're here as guests of the GRI, it's a real, it's a great shout out for archives and their value. I think we might all admit, oh sorry, Sarah Morris from UCLA, I'm an archeologist. I, I wonder whether, I mean, there's enough material for 100 years of doctoral dissertations if we really take a deep dive. But um, in a way, the, the three uh, projects, uh, Anna brought out how important the, the designs and sketches are it, it is in addition to the actual works of art for exploring this. And, Taylor's images suggest this archive has not been digitized at, uh, in Paris or not really, not fully, and you're struggling with issues of classification. Um, what right do I have to sort of decide what the purpose was of these images? In a way, Joan Miguel have just answered some questions about that. Alan Sekula was, I believe, an artist in residence here at one point in the 90s or sometime or aughts. So there's a fascinating loop back now to an artist's practice. And, but I guess my, my question for each of you is, what redirection did your research take at some point when you did a dive into these archives and realized oh, there's something else going on or my approach has to change? Thank you. Sure, although I'm, I'm thinking as I'm talking, so. <laughs> Um, with that caveat, um, I mean, I think this paper, perhaps fittingly given the imagery, has been a bit of a meandering journey. Um, 
And I think maybe some of the most fun material to get into is actually, that was throughout the larger project was not the material that ended up here, but when this rug was displayed at the St. Louis Exposition, um, or the, uh, the Louisiana Purchase Exposition in St. Louis, the way in which getting into those discussions, um, one, put it in this transatlantic context, right? And like how many of these concerns about industrialization or modernity or just these sort of massive social and political shifts are particular to Britain and how many are occurring over a wider context, which I think did end up informing some of the, the tighter focus on Britain in, in this lecture or discussion. Yeah, for me, my approach to the archival work is not so much going in and looking for something in particular, um, but more so considering the building of the archive itself, the archive itself as a collection, um, looking at the particular narratives um, put out by the archives, and you know, these frustrations in terms of like, oh, you know, and not necessarily this one, but I, there there are photographic archives out there where you get, you know, just a stack of photographs coming from who knows where with no identifying information. Um, and that itself tells us something, right? Um, it tells us about um, the value given to that certain archive and that's the value given to the material in the archive and the material that, that those photographs represent. Um, and so these, you know, problems um, or frustrations um, can also lead us in different directions, especially for a project like mine that is, you know, it's about like how are we valuing these things, how are we preserving these things, how are we relating to these things. Um, so th those things are not so much problems as, as interesting points. I really love the um, edges and margins of particularly, you know, uh, of collections and, and archival matter. Um, and, um, you know, for example, with Sekula, you know, it's like, oh, I'm gonna go look at fish stories, see the project files, try to like unpack some of the, uh, you know, thinking that went into the development of this project. And then, you know, I come to, um, uh, you know, to, to work with the Gettys in, in formidable collection, incredible collection. And, uh, and I'm like, oh wait, there's all of these notebooks, uh, which, uh, Miguel, um, which are, uh, which are uh, a whole other dimension of his thinking that um, you uh, is really not you know, seen or has not been interpreted um, and is difficult to access just looking at his work alone. Um, and that's where I really um, uh, you know, started, that's where this whole idea of the, um, a kind of critical environmental disposition of Sukula's work um, started to take purchase for me, was, was finding that. And, you know, and I'm sure every historian in the room who works with archives has had that experience of like, you go in thinking you're looking for one thing, right? And then, you know, you stumble across something else and all of your desires are transformed, you know, by that material. Um, and the, the sort of Derridian archive fever takes hold. Um, and that's, that's the best feeling. <laughs> Agreed. And Anna, what were you looking for when you, in fact, did find this rug? Like a very silly answer, but I, I was looking for a weird rug. Um, <laughs> I've been fascinated by design prescriptions around rugs for a minute, and this was a case study that suited. Fabulous. I think we have time for one more question. Going, going, gone. Okay. Um, there's no harm in uh, wrapping up. Oh, wait, there is? There's always one. All right, last, <laughs> last licks. Um, this is uh, directed to the historical photographs. Wasn't there a series of historical photographs uh, during the Middle East, during the 1830s, 1840s? Did you research the, I forgot the name of the artist who took the photographs um, of the area of the Middle East? And also, I was just wondering, the earliest photograph of the Colosseum, what date would that be? Because I was wondering if that influenced you taking and looking at photographs of that period. Um, so I'm not totally sure about the series that you're re 
referring to in the uh, middle? F I R T H, fifth? Oh, oh, okay. yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Got it. Um, yeah, so, you know, photography is invented or it's announced as, as a medium in 1839. So, you know, the 1840s are this sort of, you know, heyday for archaeological photographs, um, scare quotes there, um, because most of these images are created like people, um, like Francis Firth, who um, are photographers by training. They're going out, they're producing images of archeological sites because they make for good um, content for photographs. Um, and is that an archeological photograph? Who's to say is an archeological photograph only created by an archeologist? Um, this, is, this is a question that I'm um, grappling with, but um, yeah, the, these images are, um, are the images that influence archaeologists later who are thinking about how to represent this material. Um, in terms of when the first photograph of the Colosseum was created, I'm not totally sure off the top of my head. I'm sure it's somewhere right around 1839, 1840 approximately. Uh, please help me uh, well, uh, congratulate these uh, excellent scholars.